uh, I think we're gonna get started. So um, I guess I'll start by saying that um, I think at QBI we're known for uh, the unorthodox uh, and bringing together uh, people in different disciplines. And I definitely think that this falls into that um, a category. So it's great to have John Walter here. He's a visual artist. He's here not just for the seminar, but he's here for the entire year uh, to be working uh, with us. Uh, in the past, he has focused his art on HIV and other infectious agents, things out of commitment. You're using art to educate the public um, around uh, infectious disease. So he's here to interface with us, and I think he can help us with our problems, our scientific problems, maybe all our problems, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of them. Well, I, I think he can help us at least with our scientific problems, but I also think we can um, help him with his art, right? So I see this kind of um, as a two-way street. And the way this, this came about actually was through one of our collaborators uh, at University College London, Greg Towers. Um, actually, this is a connection made from uh, Lorena. Uh, Alvarez, because um, she used to work out in London, and Greg visited us in February and was talking about this guy. I was like, oh, this guy sounds kind of interesting. I mean, maybe he would come here. He spent two years working with them at uh, University College London, kind of doing something similar. And I thought, oh, it'd be kind of cool to get out here. And we reached out, and thankfully he's here. Um, for this year, where his home base is going to be, where his studio is going to be, is still being worked out. But I think he'll tell you how to get a hold of him. And then I just want to we're at an academic institution. I got to read out where he <laughs> his degrees. So this is important. So he did his undergrad at the Ruskin School of Drawing and Art at the University of Oxford. His master's at the Slade School of Fine Art at University College London. His PhD at the University of Westminster. And his work is owned and presented by various art galleries, including the Walker Art Gallery Liverpool and the Arts Council Collection. Okay. So let's see what John has to say. Thank you. <laughs> Well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, UCSF, QBI and Krogan Lab for inviting me and especially to Jacqueline, Vincenzo, Nevin, Gina, Alexa and Peggy for their hospitality. I am going to rattle through a lot of work this morning. So brace yourselves. This is a kind of 20 year romp in 45 minutes. Um, now, is this going to work? Yes, okay. So I want to just frame this by introducing myself as a zany. And the zany comes from our aesthetic categories. And this idea of zaniness is really from the Commedia dell'arte character, the zany. And the zany is an itinerant worker with a fluid identity. Now that could be all of us in this room as people that work in art and science. The zany is characterized by a collapse between work and play, and the gig economy exemplifies this phenomenon. The zany operates at a frantic speed. Hello. The zany is attractive because he or she is an extrovert, but up close that energy is dangerous, and precarity is part of this zaniness. Something I've been thinking about recently is how does the zany differ from the minstrel? So one of the things that I do is I make light of things but that lightness uh, um, Irving Goffman talks about this in relation to stigma is the is the outsider that minstrelizes themselves making this uh, a good or a bad thing is this helping or hindering progress this is a question floating in my mind from London to Auckland. This is very a comeback, quiet, sorry. A resurrection this is an exorcism. The beginnings of a, a circumcision that I gave in yes. New Zealand. Rehydrated like the freeze dried coffee of drag that she the is. Video that her pronouns played behind me as I was us. To form. She's had two strokes in the past this is probably year. Probably better alone, to listen to and the self help screen. isn't going too well either. Please give a massive welcome to addicted to self dot Shitney Cunstone. Doomsday is coming. In the beginning so, was the word. I'm an artist and the word works with me. me. And you're people that work with genes in various ways. This is a and this means religion. word was cooked up by Richard Dawkins. This is a user as part of the selfish gene. This Whereas you user. deal with biological replication, I'm really dealing with cultural replication. And the big thing that's on my mind here is thinking about how can I import strategies from your work into my mimetic re-engineering and how can my understanding of 
how nature works at the level of culture impact on what you do at a scientific level. This will be the back and forth. So one thing to bear in mind, Marvin Minsky says, it's not enough to learn a lot. One also has to manage what one learns. Those masters beneath the surface of their mastery have some special knacks of higher order expertise, which help them organize and apply the things they learn. It's these tricks of mental management that produce the systems that create these works of genius. Now, we're all dealing with complexity here and multitasking, and this seems to be the key question. So I want to try and make my artistic practice as transparent as possible so that you can pose questions of me. Um, and I want to really show you today that creativity is synthetic, it's hierarchical, and it's emergent. Uh, it's a series of clever tricks, as Daniel Dennett might put it. This might surprise you that it's formulaic, but that it's to do with iteration, and we'll come back to that. So I want to show you that what appears to the outsider as genius can be exposed as the upregulation of subroutines and combinatorial processes. Maybe catalyzation and compression are two of them. But I'm going to get the words out of the way and then we'll get into images, but this is important. Douglas Hofstadter says, we are all curious little collages, weird little planetoids that grow by accreting other people's habits and ideas and styles and ticks and jokes and phrases and tunes and hopes and fears as if they were meteorites that came soaring out of the blue, collided with us and stuck. And these are some of the meteorites that hit me when I was young. Les Dawson, who's a famous British comedian. So there's a particular type of humor that I operate within. Pee Wee Herman was a big influence and you'll see that come through a lot. Um, American painting, particularly postmodern painting, people like David Sally, in a kind of collage space, an eclecticism or an appropriation painting. Uh, there's a particular David Bowie album. I'm showing these things to say that the work doesn't just come from nowhere. It grows out of existing meme plexes. And then I have to re-engineer them in or out of the repertoire. And they include gay memes as well, by the way. Um, so before I get into it, I can only skim the surface today. If you want to do a deep dive, you can go to my website and you can find the back catalog of projects. Most of it's on there. Um, so be careful, you might lose a day. This is my studio in London about three months ago. This is the structure. I'm going to talk about materials, techniques. I'm going to talk about six projects, Alien Sex Club, Capsid, Patterns in Time, Jezreel's Tower, Happy Crust, and Sydney Ducks. So I'm going to romp through those. So this is just to give you some sort of bedrock things, materials that I keep using. Drawing. This is a small drawing from Alien Sex Club. Um, this whole phenomenon of crystal dip, when people are taking crystal meth and then various uppers and downers. Sometimes I'll take a phrase. You might use a piece of jargon. I might illustrate it in a way that it wasn't meant to be. And that might be useful. Watercolors, this is uh, a a Alexis Carrington from, Din uh, from Dynasty. I'm a, I, I rewatched most of Dynasty and most of Dallas at a certain point, but this is a medium that I use a lot and you'll see. Painting is at the heart of what I do. And we'll talk a lot about pictorial space. This is a painting from a series called the Rococo Riots. I can go into more detail about these things later. This is a big mural I made for Facebook headquarters in London. They probably demolished it now. Um, and one of the things I do is make big books of paintings. This book is bigger than me. It's about two and a half meters wide. I don't know what that is in feet, but uh, it's 49 paintings. Each is a paisley pattern with uh, an illustration by an Italian illustrator, Jacovitti, from his Kama Sutra inserted into it to re-engineer it to be more fertile. The, the paisley pattern, as we'll discover later, is a fertility symbol. So this is the Jacobiti paisley. Sculptures, these are pieces from Capsid. These are uh, drinking fists from Las Vegas with objects in them. Printmaking is the thing I, I keep returning to. These are lithographs uh, from the Capsid series. I'll talk more about the imagery later. 
installation is a big part of what I've done. This is quite an old piece of work now. This is uh, a character I played called Masonic Yoda, who lived inside a book from an, an installation uh, called The Tarot Garden. And performance. This is me performing with the lockdown tarot. And hopefully I'll do some tarot readings while I'm here. Um, this is a, a very short extract from a video I made for Capsid. Uh, you'll see that I, when I'm in lab meetings, I'll take odd notes. I thought jumbo phage was quite good yesterday. That'll probably appear. But this is a, a list of jargon that gets mashed up with other people's jargon, not just your jargon. And it takes on poetic meaning. One of the things that's characterized my work from my peers is that I've taken control of the curation of it using spatial design and architecture. And my PhD was in an architecture faculty. This allows me to have more control over how it's framed. This is the model for when Caps had traveled to Manchester. Ah, I make music. I'm gonna sing you a song. I built up the status of a personal belief. My means got nurtured by a terrifying thief. Oh, this sounds so loud. I built up the status of a personal belief. Ideas infected me. I felt such relief. I built up the status of a personal belief. My thinking grew into a social cowardly. This is a mean plan. A kind of dream plan.在一个小山丘上，伟大的是我的悲伤。他没有注意到我，也没有询问。他没有问我怎么样，我看到你上去了，到了牛棚。在一个小山丘上，伟大的是我的悲伤。他从我身旁经过，在一匹灰马上，步
But improvisation is a big part of what I do. And where that improvisation sits will vary from project to project. This is a piece where I sang the news on a live feed for six hours, dressed as six characters. This is a character called the Fabergé hen, who lays the Fabergé eggs. Um, shonkiness is about approximation. Shonkiness is a, is a very evolutionary strategy, but shonkiness is about having a go at something, having a stab. It's about punk. This is a, a drawing by Arakawa and Gins, an architectural duo for a house that will extend your life expectancy by forcing you to walk in funny ways. It's a preposterous notion, but it's a stimulating thought. And the, the issue here is how do you scramble the coordinates for your own thinking so that you come out with novel discoveries? And that seems to unify our disciplines. And approximation might be a first stab at something. Seriality, you'll see I always work in series and that's a way of finding a good one, a bad one and some mediocre ones. That seems very pertinent. And different types of collage are, this is a painting from a long, long time ago, maybe 20 years ago. This is a, col this is a collage painting really. It's a painted collage. This is a montage painting. This is all about floating space. This is a very big painting. It's bigger than that screen. This is about transparency. If you make something transparent versus opaque, the thing becomes different. These are the kind of operations I can give things to make them. Come in, hello. This is a painting called Here Comes Lorraine Again. And it features the crazy frog and a fresco from, uh, from Rome. I did a residency at the British School at Rome for two years. And I'm a kind of serial collaborator and a serial, as we talked about earlier, this itinerant worker. Um, and a lot of the work plugs into surrealist strategies. So it will start in doodling maybe, or automatic writing, and then I'll find things in the work and it will grow in a new direction. And another main device that underpins everything is color field. You'll see that everything is very colorful and that's because I really build things using color space. And that will become more apparent as, as we get to know each other more, but um, color is totally context dependent. And if you're talking about protein maps or interactomes and the, the you know, the role of a protein changing maybe depending on its context. That's the same for color and temperature changes and mood changes or meaning changes. It's a very, very sensitive uh, machine to play with. So the work often employs appropriation, which is maybe a controversial thing that we, as, as we go on, there's a, the memes have something different to say about appropriation. If you take a memes eye view on things, which I tend to these days, the memes just wanna get replicated. They don't really care how, they just wanna hitch a ride. Um, and I think this is relevant to both things. I have used hospitality as a way of joining things together, running bars. This is a bar that I ran when I did the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture, which is in Maine, which is a big summer program. This was Night Sluts, the bar that I ran. People understand what a bar is and they can come to the bar and you can talk to them about the art or the science and they can pose questions of it in very informal ways. Lexicons. This is a tarot set from Alien Sex Club. You can make, from these 78 cards, you can make lots of different stories. And I often curate things as well. This is a show called Patternicity. Why do human beings always find patterns in things? And yeah, this is me and Greg Towers. He's dressed as a scientist, I'm dressed as an artist. Um, the way to, I think Krogan Lab and, and QBI understand this inherently too, the way to unleash things into the world is often to find partnerships that can uh, 
take the thing beyond my skill set or my my realm and uh, certainly working with greg and other people often working with people that are far away from me disciplinarily is useful and an increasingly world building is the thing that glues all these things together this is a uh, still from a, a vr world that i built about uh a woman who believed she was she was the new messiah this will this will become a theme later on as well so this is something to bear in mind art is not an object it is an event you'll see that everything i make is material somehow but the real consequence of it is that something happens when you come to it uh, it might have to be material to for that that, that event to happen but the event is the thing to take away so I never meant to do a PhD. I was very uh, loath to analyze things in this way, but this project needed a home and it found a home in academia. What is Alien Sex Club? Well, this was the, we went on the march in, this is Pride March in London in 2015. We were situated between Google and Anal Angels, which seemed like a good place to be. Um, Alien Sex Club, I think the subtitle of the PhD was Educating Audiences About Ongoing Rates of HIV Transmission Using Art and Design. This was 2017, I think I completed it. Um, in 2015, when I started, there was a big spike in HIV transmissions, particularly among men who have sex with men here and in the UK and in big cities. And it was a lot to do with chemsex and the use of crystal meth and other recreational drugs. I'm going to show you some of the show first, and then I'll talk about how the show came about. This is Pug Virus. He's a big inflatable imaginary virus. This was the prep curtain where you could walk through the curtain and it would immunize you as you came into the installation, which was, this, is, this thing was epic. It was massive. It's made of cardboard and paintings, books of paintings, neons, uh, things that are sunk into the wall and the floors. There's videos, this is playing, this is a video called Strategic Positioning that's playing on the back of a kind of glory hole booth as if we were in some sort of adult bookstore. These are capsids, which we'll come back to. The whole thing is a kind of carnivalesque and it's not hung in a normal art way. It's very topsy-turvy and some of it is under blue light. There's three live elements. You can get a free rapid HIV test from Terence Higgins Trust in the shed. You can get a tarot reading from Barbara Truvada, or you can get a gin and tonic from the chem jester. These seem like silly moments, but those moments of interaction allow you to talk about the work and disseminate the content in, in very unusual ways. And it stimulates it stimulates the, the, the dissemination of the work. So this was my kind of map at the time of what was going on in HIV, particularly, we're talking about MSM particularly, but it was a, it was a web of problems and questions and it needed a web-like solution. And that web-like solution was a maze. This is a big painting called Prostate Palace, which also had a song, which I won't sing you. It is a good song. Um, this is a uh, this is the, all these things are from series. I'm showing you singular ones, but think of them as series. This is a, a hat on a marrow, and there was an interest in this idea of condom fatigue. So really, this is HIV from a sexual health perspective at this point. So we're not getting into the nano machinery yet. Coffins for the AIDS dead, pills. This idea of pill burden being reduced over time. These are, this is a character called Seaman Demon. He's a 3D print. Um, the sounds not moving very loud on this one. This is the video for Crystal Nick. Met Matt this guy online today. today. Said, he said, he said he was hanging with Tina. Said he was hanging with Tina. What I'm showing you here is really how things I never met right. her. They, they jump species, they jump discipline. And in jumping species, they take on some of the traits of the other medium and something slops over that wasn't in the initial variant or something like this. 
Now, this is the plan for part of a, a gay sauna in London that seemed to me to emblematize how the show could happen. And there's this idea of a cruise maze, which is never as exciting as it sounds. It's a corridor. But it's this idea that there's risks to be taken sexually that are fetishized. And maybe that's a way of organizing an exhibition. And so then I built the model in the computer of the space and built my own cruise maze that you could adventure through and made it as a physical model as well. And then later on, the show got exhibited as part of an exhibition at the Welcome Collection, where it was staged at great expense and not punk at all. And it was suddenly, it had been taken into the canon. And so this is also a strange phenomenon of art, where the thing starts out as punk and then you become the queen before you know it. <laughs> so this is just for me to remember as well. I'm not here to illustrate the science, although that is a starting point. I'm here to exchange analogies, and I think that's the main thing we can do. So through that alien sex club project, I came across this whole phenomenon of viral capsids, and particularly the interest in the strange shape of the HIV capsid. And that's how I got into working with Greg. And I had built these things. This is a, I don't know what, this is a meter 20 high. And I was sitting with some video I found online that had been made at the University of Champaign, Illinois, where they'd modeled this thing. And I, it was the only information I could get about where are the pentamers and the hexamers. And nobody, and Greg couldn't believe that anybody had bothered making this, but it really helped me understand it being a very fragile structure and a very strong structure at the same time. It's brittle. It only just holds together long enough to do what it needs to do. And I made this video and it really is my instruction manual for the whole project. It's me making a cartoon version of the science of what's going on with viral entry and how is the capsid of, of HIV interacting with the cell that it infects? How is it a sneak? You know, this is what Lorena and, and Greg and the team were talking about, these narratives around subterfuge or uh, the, the capsid being covert but how was it using the pentamers and the hexamers to, uh, to regulate transcription? You know, what was it doing in the cytoplasm? How was it moving? How was it uh, working to, to recruit cofactors in the cytoplasm to hide it or uh, help transport it to the nuclear pore? and then do what it wanted to do. So this was, this was a, a little cartoon that I could come back to and then make other artworks from. And one of the main artworks, this is the, the trailer for a feature film. Well, it's a 20 minute film called A Virus Walks Into A Bar, which I'll screen here in October. And this is the trailer and it, it really tells that uh, life cycle story as if we're somewhere between Twin Peaks uh, a British soap opera like Coronation Street and the Teletubbies, and everybody is wearing a onesie. So this, we will circulate this soon, but we'll do a screening. Hi, I'm, I'm the, the and these are some of the costumes, including on the far right, Capsid, who has exactly the right number of pentamer and hexamer patches that I made. So then that life cycle thing got broken down into paintings like the cytoplasm paintings, or the innate sensing mechanism paintings. How do you trick a painting to receive a foreign object? You use pattern to suppress the immune responses of the pictorial field. These are sort of upside down ways of thinking, I know, but they're ways of making a new type of painting by using the science analogies. This is a very big painting. It's five meters long, which is, it's not as long as this whole wall, but it's getting on for that way. And this is from the, the, co, the Co-Factor series. Each painting has lots of doubles hidden within it that only emerge after a, a long viewing. And one of the things I should say about painting is it works at two speeds. There's an image speed it works at immediately, and there's a delayed speed where things come through over time. It's a slow release mechanism. Big silkscreen paintings. This is a piece of sheet steel that I plasma cut. This was to do with 
What's happening when the capsid unfolds? Um, more slang, more phrases that I've heard in lab meetings that land on, on canvas or on paper. And then this was a very structural problem of how do you make a, a circular painting? And budding seems to have a, a suggested solution for this. The thing has got to leak out of itself. A painter, for a painter, it's very hard to make a shaped painting. A painting is somehow related to the room it's in and most rooms are rectangular. So you've either got to make a circular room or a circular wall, or you've got to somehow make the painting. Anyway, this is something we can return to. So this was the installation that it, it became. And you could walk on a floor of the drawings. This is an enormous capsid wallpaper. Uh, it's a total immersion. It's overwhelming. It's, there's something for everybody in, in a way because it's hitting all the senses. And that project led me really to think about if how are cultural forms transmitting. And the Paisley pattern is a great exemplar of that. And that became Patterns in Time, which I partly explored during a residency equivalent to this at the Cardley Institute in Delft, at the, the Technical University in Delft. And this, was a, this is a still from a film they made there called Artist in the Lab which I quite liked, and that's me painting. Um, so this is the Paisley pattern, which some of you will know. Different people will know it by different names. Uh, it really gets, uh, gets going in Europe in the Victorian period, but it starts much earlier than that. Why I'm talking about it is it's a great example of a replicator. It demonstrates fecundity, fidelity, longevity. And it's like a cell, it's got a cell wall, it's got a nucleus, it's got a cytoplasm, it's got surface proteins, it's got a cytoskeleton, it's got nanomachinery, and it evolves. This is a particular version of the, the pattern, which is uh, more like a cornucopia or a flower arrangement, it's a bote. And the pattern has, the pattern, cultural forms can, can evolve much faster than uh, biological ones. It's a different design space, but um, th these are my versions of some of those things. These are my botes. That's the, one of the names of it, and what comes to the etymology of it. But in any project, there's an arc of discovery. And this was my earliest attempt at embedding the Paisley into other things. This is the Shoe People Paisley. Shoe People were a cartoon that I grew up with but they look uncannily like the cytoplasm painting. So they sort of start in the old project and they grow to become a new project. And I think that's the same in both disciplines. A lot of people think that the, the paisley comes from mango sprouting, but it starts somewhere in Persia and it gets transmitted along the Silk Road via trade. And it really gets going in Kashmir and it gets woven into shawls this is from the medieval period onwards. And then when the East India Company gets going, it gets imported to Europe and it gets a hold in Scotland in a town called Paisley that gives it its English name, but also in France and other places. So depending on your language group, you'll describe it a different name. And this is from a series called The Silk Roads, where I really return to the the leaf nature of the pattern, and I re-engineer it. These are the quasies, the quasleys, the quasi-paisleys. Evolution is cleverer than you are. Note to self. Early attempts to bring the paisley back into being a pattern again. So this is the heritage paisleys, a bit like you might have a heritage carrot. Can you reactivate it by breeding it with an old cultivar? Yes. And this is the buddies. If you, if you live in Paisley in Scotland, you call each other a buddy. Now, there's theories that this is, they, they've inherited it from, from the US, but um, this is a Paisley buddy. And this shawl thing, the, the, these, this is a shawl format called a dochala, which is a particular way of arranging the motif to wear, but I remade it as paintings. So these are strategies for the re-engineering of the form. Moon shawls, where there's a circular form in the middle, and then the pattern is 
refracted across a shawl becomes a different way of making a painting or the zebra stripe paisley all these types this is this is how i will interrogate a problem from all angles or bringing it back into applique and, and fabric and sewing or sculpture but then they then there's a kind of denouement where the thing arrives at a, a, a big shebang and this 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 is the most exciting outcome for me from this project which is the synthetic bote series these are these are kind of synthetic cells where i can i have to sort of plug the the paintings into one another i embed them in, it's almost like a, a eukaryotic cell or something there's some kind of folding inwards and doubling and um that solves the problem structurally or this method where you can keep it as a rectangle, but you embed the paintings within one another. The, when I was in Delft, the equivalent of the Paisley is the, um, the Delft Blue, which is really a Dutch version of a Chinese painting technique that has come down the Silk Road as well. So this kind of cultural transmission, this, this meme journey is everywhere around us. We just have to scratch the surface to see it from the meme's eye perspective. Okay. I'm getting there. I'm not too bad. Jezreel's Tower. This is a, a VR piece where people wear headsets with masks that I've made. And so it's not boring if you're watching somebody in the headset. And this is the tower that I refer to. It was a real building that was destroyed in the 60s. It was built by a cult. Cults are particularly good at memes. And they're good at infecting brains with memes. Um, and this is a, a, a very short clip of what Today, it looks a bit like to be Mrs. inside the 360 video. England I play all 32 parts and it tells the story of this cult and how they people. use a structure of uh, wonder newspapers, man. graphics, music, reflexes to spread their message and infect people. They travelled from Medway in Kent, which is a place just outside London in the UK, all the way to Michigan and New Zealand and other parts of the, the New World. And they recruited people who would come back to England and uh, join the cult, fund the cult. And the, the leader of the cult, James Jershon Jezreel, as he renamed himself, was a very charismatic man and he used a lot of uh, Judaica, Jewish imagery, to infect uh, how the, the memes, to make the memes more infectious, basically. But this is to say that there is a relationship between the genes and the memes, and the, 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 the memes can piggyback off the off the genes to get what they want and this is often going on in religions are great examples of successful meme plexes that have gone on over time this was the storyboard for the film and then some of the costumes and the wallpapers another world that i've been building and i'm i'm coming close to the end is happy crust and this this will feed directly into what i'm doing here even though it might not seem it this is a world set underneath the crust of a pie. The tagline is get cozy under the pastry. And it's a children's world, although it's fairly adult as well, that I've been devising for years with my friend Samantha Hardingham, who may be watching, I don't know. And we finally decided during lockdown that we should bring this into the world. So I've been drawing it in books. This is Eddie Mamu, who's an edamame bean, and his best friend, Peach Ice Tea. And their friend, frenemy, uh, pal, uh, my Japanese scientist in his van lab where experiments go wrong. Uh, this is one of the boats on the custard canal, the Bezzy mate. Um, this is the prawn guards outside King Prawn's pyramid. And then these things can, these are very big paintings. This is probably the size you see it there. This is a close up on Captain Frogspawn. What you can see is that everything's very biological, very biomorphic, but also um, the cartooning is a way to let people in. This is to go back to the hospitality. My stupidity forgives your stupidity as the audience member. And if I can be the fool, you can ask silly questions of me and then we can have a serious conversation. And so it's, it's a form of generosity that allows people in. These are the critters living in the holes in the crust. 
And so this brings us right up to Sydney Ducks, which is an NFTs project. And what's a good way to talk about NFTs? Well, what are the Sydney Ducks for a start? So I knew I was coming to San Francisco and I read a history of the city, particularly the gold rush. And there was a group of ex-cons from Australia that came over during the gold rush and burned San Francisco down. And that triggered a vigilante group to be set up to stop them from doing it again. And they were called the Sydney Ducks. This is real. This stuff, I find this stuff and I think it's too good to be true. And then I think, no, you can't use it, it's too obvious. And then I think, no, you probably should. This is one of the Genesis collection NFTs that will, this, if this is jargon you don't understand, don't worry. The main thing is you need to know you can buy digital stuff now. And it's a new way to build worlds. This, this is made in the virtual reality and in other animation packages. And there's a whole cast of characters. It's a way of telling stories. The, the NFT space is quite butch. It's quite boyish. It's quite geeky. Maybe I can infect it with some other stories, some other strategies, maybe with some of the science that's going on. These are cards from the duck decks, which is uh, a, a kind of encyclopedia for the, for the Sydney ducks. There's always a, a, a lead and a supporting character. Oh, they all have pronouns, viral loads. We don't know which viruses they have and, uh, and occupations. And then this is a portion of the map. Um, it's set in 2049. There's been another earthquake. There's also been a sea level rise. The city hall is now floating in the bay somewhere. The story will unfold as the year goes on. But to, to come to the conclusions, while I'm beginning my time here, I'm thinking about mulching. What is that? This is the beginnings of mulching. Mulching is taking the last thing you did and breaking it down into its constituent parts before you grow it to become the new thing. And these are doodles in my notebook that I've been scanning and beginning. I'm beginning to re-engineer them with protein maps that you've sent me. In the middle are uh, a series of pox patterns that I'm making that will become costumes and jackets for Nevin. And then on the far side are the beginnings of my variants of concern, which are me really breeding a new cast of characters fit for my stay here that can talk about the science you're doing. And so this is to conclude. But you know, what I want to say is to be an artist is to be an engineer of memes, and I'm improving the fitness of their memes. Creativity begins with low level repetitive processes. I'm not a god that gets landed in from somewhere else. And these creative habits that I might call an artistic practice are iterated until they give way to something new. Something will emerge out of them, and then I can capture that. But also something I wanted to think about is this word to invent really had a different meaning early on. It meant to discover. And I think that the discovery in science, the uncovering and the invention of art, at a certain point, they must meet. And that's something I want to wonder during the year. So thank you for coming. And I'm sure that was as baffling as it was enlightening. But if, if you have questions, please pose them now. Thank you. Yes. So I can imagine. Yeah. I can imagine you know, inviting you or hosting you for mm. discussion, but then you know, I'm just hearing this kind of conversation. But, but how can we? How can you reciprocate? Like, how can we like visit with you? Uh, yeah. So you can come to my studio, which at the moment is in Klim's old office, but we'll move soon, and I'll give you the the address. I can't say exactly, but I have a I have a room open door, you can knock, you can come and hang out, it can be informal, you can also arrange to meet me at a certain time and place and we can make it formal. I think that it's great if I can come to lab meetings and find out that the great thing about a year is we don't have to rush to a solution. You know, for some, for some of the collaboration, it might be very literal, it might be, can you help me redraw this thing? Or how would you arrange this thing? Then it might be on another level, you know, it might be that I interact with some software you've got, or you know, you might have papers you want to send me that I can read that can, I think 
we for every PI and for every group, there'll be different ways of collaborating and at different levels, you know, in all seriousness, I'm talking to the cleaner and I'm talking to you and the impact that I can have. I don't think Nevin's point, you know, I'm here to help in lots of ways. I'm an interloper and that can dislodge things in surprising ways. So yeah, I'll come, please invite me and then come and come and see me whenever you like. And whoever, you're all welcome. Yeah, and I guess um, disseminate out to the community, right? Uh, mm -hmm. to, to people who you think would uh, enjoy interacting with John. I think coming to lab meetings is great. I think that's what you're that's what you've done in the scientific yeah. uh, atmosphere. That's before. the good starting point. Good point. Yeah. I've got a question on the um, the Zoom from Medi. How do you inspire yourself to be creative? How can we as scientists do this? he and i were talking about this the other day a bit and i and we were joking that we need to start a boredom award because i was talking about how important it was for me to get into a position of boredom before the thing gets triggered that i often need mundanity and i take weekends off by the way which might be controversial but that really helps me then to reflect on the thing and then get going but often i need a kind of I need to let the thing get into a rut so that I can go. Then, then a thing kicks in in my brain where I go, oh, what can I hook up to get myself interested again? And that's that's what the creativity is. So hopefully that answers that, Mehdi. I yeah. don't feel tired. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Just to be clear, Brian is the faculty member that is more easily. Fantastic. We were destined to meet. Brilliant. Well, we need to print you some shirts. Well, we can maybe we need to start a shop. <laughs> I got it with the M and Sex Club, how you can have impact. And so I'm just wondering if you step back. And look at the things that you've done so far. What do you think has had the biggest impact on the scientific world? Okay, so with Capsid, the, uh, maybe I've not talked about the, the impact enough. With Capsid, we had an audience in Manchester, a physical audience of over 10,000 people. People get to interact with the science in a different way. And it might be an entry point. It might be that they come away with a superficial understanding and or a deep understanding. It would depend how they engage. There's a book that came out with Capsid that I've got here that I can circulate. And there's a, a legacy of the website. It also, that work goes into collections and the conversation about the science leaks in. That sounds like a kind of lame answer in that there's different speeds of impact. It, we're not talking about the same kind of impacts the science on its own will have, of course. But I do think that popularizing of the science is important because it talks about the science in a different voice that makes it less jargonistic or technical and invites people across the border. Certainly there's more we can do about that. And that's a conversation we should have. This isn't television. This isn't, um, you know, Brian Cox talking about the planets or whatever. But I think there's an, what we saw in Capsid was there is an audience for experiencing science in an artistic context differently from an audience that wants to experience science in a scientific context. Well, if we can, in a year, if we can set some goals now, yeah, that's something I'd love to participate. Yeah, brilliant. We'll talk about it. Jacqueline. Yeah. Can you stand up? And what that would be the So I there's two there's two people involved in making the painting, me and you. I'm, I'm making the painting for me initially. I'm the first test site of that. But if it's just a masturbation, it's nothing. I've got to think about what are you gonna get out of this? And that's where the imagery can come in. There's got to be hooks, reference points, entry points that are decipherable to you. And they're culturally specific. Even in the language zone of English, coming to the US means that shifts. And so, that's a kind of temperature gauge where I have to kind of, in this first phase, set up a, 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 a kind of system of references that will allow me to hang all the science off it. 
And that's where the cartooning helps. Yeah. Prosper. <laughs> begin with, it seems that your stick to uh, your work cut across disciplines and promotes collaboration from different angles, disciplines, or artistic work, or scientific or disciplinary. So the question now is, how do you see yourself yeah. in engineering or helping us groom the next generation to see the need to weave through disciplinary enclaves of art, mm -hmm. and art for its sake, or visual and scientific work that needs to speak to one another using societal issues as a way of interlocking. So yeah. as to make sure that the general public has a way of yeah. understanding and then eating those works that are being created. I, I think this conversation is the is the key foundation of it by inviting me in and making the step change it opens up this possibility for the future that it's not to say we homogenize everything and you suddenly have one of every discipline in this room but it's to say that these kind of interactions should be normal and that then we can you need to be able to speak about your thing on multiple levels you need to be able to speak to your specialist colleagues and to the kid in the school and your, your mum, uh, you know, you need to be able to disseminate it in as many ways as possible. Then the thing is getting activated. And so, yes, that's, if we can, I think just by having me here and by you and I having that interaction, that will begin to filter out, you know, and, and become normalized. And we just need to make projects. And then, then those, some of those things will become traditions I mean, you already do it in the lab. People in, introduce themselves and where they came from, conversations about diversity. This is all building on that, I think, and making it more substantial. And one comment here, just yeah. with respect to the goals, I do think that's important. I don't, I don't think we should be too rigid a priori. I think we should just let it see where it goes as, as, uh, I guess as we absorb you or maybe yeah. you observe all of us who knows we'll see what happens but I, I think there'll be some very interesting things that come out of this at the end. and things will lock in at a certain point and then outcomes can really be you know and i suspect there'll be some very interesting activities definitely i should hope so i can't wait to see some of those and um i also listening to uh, i think we should, it should be a prerequisite now for all our speakers to sing a song <laughs> I like that. I've ruined it for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any other questions for John? Yeah. Um, so, in your later work, because like, I feel like it's very aimed at like, public action on fairness, this like, future law yeah. project. Do you, how does fairness in your job? Yeah, I think it's just in there in a way. I mean, that's what I'm talking about early on those those mean plexes that kind of infected me as a teenager. The, the queer theory route is not the route I took in the PhD, I, but it was, it was inherently there. Um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not trying to sell a Kool-Aid and I'm not trying to be, uh, oh, if I am, it's not the queer Kool-Aid. It, it happens to be a Kool-Aid I probably do drink, but I probably drink the science Kool-Aid more. So I don't think, I think artists are propagandists, you know, that from Medici, whenever, you know, you're paid by somebody, um, but I don't have an agenda. So I guess it will come in and out. I mean, those characters have all got funny queer stories. When you start to see the duck decks, you know, and the pronouns can go quiet wild so i think it's in there but it's not a particular aim to push that it's more to let it sit well, so we should refer to Nevin as maybe 
No, what I never. <laughs> I'll take that. Um, okay, so yeah, get the word out. Uh, reach out to Johnny. He'll have a home base very soon. Uh, if you want to get in touch with him, email me or, or Jacqueline. But, and they'll be the premiere. Yeah, and they'll be the. <laughs> we'll show a virus walks into a bar. We'll do the 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 American premiere. We'll screen it you'll get you you'll get an email soon right. enjoy the rest of your day thank you for coming okay.